Yes, today we're joined by Glenn's Vodka Championship Manager of the Month for March, Derek McKillis! Yes. By the way, how stunning is he? I'm just going to say, no just Manager of the Month, but also the most handsome manager of the year we've gave you. Or not uh, we go. Ni award for that, but is there? He's going to get you an award after that. Yeah. When Cheers the cameras sorry. gets turned off, you get your award for him. Maybe Mal come up and bring it up to you. But we need to know, <laughs> how, how do you keep him in such good nick? Oh, it's a constant battle, isn't it? I think, uh, you know, the one thing I really do miss about playing is, is being fit. You know, having that discipline and, uh, you know, constantly having to kind of make sure you are right to perform. You know, I think I miss that. And I, when I think about when I stopped playing, there was no real decision. It just became a player manager and effectively just stopped picking myself. And when I look back now, um, although I had knee injuries and all the rest of it, um, I miss being fit because I needed to be fit to mm -hmm. get by and play. And, um, so How you were a, you were a baller though, now you popped ah, the ball I could a play, but you know, obviously fitness was a big part. I always felt I was, I always felt the guy I was up against wouldn't have worked harder than me Monday to Friday. And love I loved, that. I loved going onto a pitch on a Saturday knowing that no matter how good he was, whether we're playing Rangers, Celtic, playing down the road, um, whoever against you're playing, I knew I'd worked harder than him. Um, mm. so that was important to me. Uh, but now it's just the constant battle, just try to eat less and, do a wee bit when you can, like you walk with the dogs and stuff like that, and uh, go out in the bite occasionally, and but nothing really because my my knees are are not good to be honest. Mm. My knees are rotten. To Only be downside of his management never ever try to sign his mate. That's, 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 that's a good thing. That's a good thing. That's why he is the manager. Uh, he is. I just never <laughs> ever thought we could have afforded you. No, I don't. No. Maybe that's a few, that's a few managers that have said that. No. I was Alexander that said that as well. But see, they'll see just don't say obviously. Yes, there's a big announcement. Got to be your first job. Uh, Any advice for him on that? I take it, you're going to stop playing? I don't know. See, I think you should, to be honest. No, no, because you'll probably be your best player um, at, at your club. I don't know who you're going to be signing and what squad you're putting together, but I just don't think you can do it. I, I look back at player managers, successful player managers. Ken Douglas. I put myself as a Douglas. Ken Douglas had all that boot room <laughs> support, you know, all that Anfield support. Graham Souness had Walter and and the like. Um, but there's very few that, that can, can do both. I think... Mm -hmm. your, your head's like a toy shop mm -hmm. on the pitch and you're constantly trying to improve others and that's your job your manager as a manager is to set your team up to win a game and improve boys and if you're constantly still trying to deal with your own side of it um, I think it's too much yeah. you might get away with it for a while and you might want to set the tempo and that's what I was thinking maybe at the start going and do it maybe but I, I don't think it's sustainable to be honest yeah. so um, well you're starting it's exciting for you and it's obviously something you want to get into but um, I would say it's probably the, the first kind of step towards stopping playing, to mm. be honest. I got on my point of it with Pataudry as well. Do you remember it? We, that? we were beating you 3 1 at Dundee. I used to play against it was about four minutes to go. Hartley was like, right, going. I, I, I was going through a terrible time at Dundee. He couldn't pass the ball. I blew a jersey. Need him, huh? Four minutes to go. No, he was a manager. Four minutes to go. Put me on 3 1. Shanklin, it was. Shanklin, two, was it two goals? 3 2, mate. I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> mate, I haven't even touched the ball. 3-3 three, three, and it's the fucking Alamo mate I don't know how you, you get your man in the match with Spencer <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember it I don't remember it I remember the goal I remember the finish nah. um, but I didn't think I remember you cheering when I, I was getting warm, warm, warming up boys have uh, got a fucking chance he's uh, coming on no not at all uh, right Kelly are up mate unbelievable did, see when you first went in there Dale did you think I can get this group of players up well I did I'd went in the uh, um, I remember when Tommy lost his job, it came up the ticker tape and I was sitting at home, my wife and I had just got a Chinese in and we were just, um, and I hadn't genuinely thought, I was a bit surprised at it and it wasn't even a thinking of, oh, maybe if I go at that job or whatever, we'd booked to go on holiday, um, we we're thinking about going in, in January. Um, so I was a bit shocked when I seen he'd lost his job. So when it came round and, and Kelly, I was due to have the conversation with Kumar, um, I went and watched a broth in Burness. Uh, and I took the game in and looked at both teams. You could see the qualities of both teams, all the rest of it. And obviously, Kamarnock were, I think, third or fourth at the time. Um, and then I looked at the squad a wee bit more in depth and I thought there was good players there. Um, and there must be a reason why I struggled. I, their home form was really poor, considering they were up there. Um, and nobody's won a title or won anything without being strong at home. So <clears throat> I knew we could maybe address that. But once I spoke to the board, um, there were loads of good people there and I felt like it felt all of a sudden more right than no. So, and then once we were in that first day with the boys and just try to drag a wee bit more confidence out of them and personality, I think there was a lot of frustration, part of a relegated team, a lot of the fans, maybe no trust in the team at home and things weren't going right. It wasn't perfect for the players and 
maybe some would get into their shell, but there was a reason why they weren't performing what the way they could have. So we had to address that. And I think the biggest thing for me was the home form. I think we won nine out of ten league games. At, um, and that was a catalyst, really, to, 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 to win in the league. So what a bunch of boys. I mean, I've been involved in loads I of games. Magic, huh? ah, magic, they're up there. Honestly, it's been... For myself and Dot and Peanut, we've, we love going in, honestly, bounce into work in the morning. They're, they're an absolute pleasure. And it helps when you're winning most weeks. Obviously, you're part of a winning dressing room, but, you know, we try to take, we never try to take that pressure away from them. The pressure was there. There's no point in trying to under, underplay it, but just try to deal with it by being good Monday to Friday, get loads of spirit, loads of enthusiasm, loads of togetherness, set them up right and, you know, putting demands on them. But, no, they're the ones that have got the job done and they deserve so much credit because everybody's saying, I've come on it on the desk, I know that. And I heard what everybody was saying. There's three or four better teams in the league. A championship manager actually fought me up three days after getting the job. Um, ex-championship manager, he's played, managed most of his career in there. And, wow. and he says, I think there's about three teams better and come on it. He says, but all the best. And we had a chat about it and he started, he says, I just don't know what they are. They've not got size at centre forward. They've not got enough pace. They don't pass the ball well enough. They've not got enough passes in the team. And he rounded off three teams who he thought were better. So. And they're just sitting a, in the house. It was just an the honest, it was just an honest opinion. You know what I mean? And, and to be fair, I, um, I respected his opinion. Um, but, you know, I set about the task, tried to get a few additions in, brought Big Ash up, brought Kyle in. Uh, I thought we needed more personality, more size in the team. And, and Big Kyle, I thought at this level, would score goals, and obviously he did do that. So we um, we quickly got a bit of confidence into the team. You could see them improving, put a wee bit more demand on them, but they've been absolutely brilliant. And every dressing room you're involved in when you're successful, you look back with real fondness. I still, I'm still close with a lot of my St Johnson players and uh, a lot of my Aberdeen players. Mm -hmm. Still message, and it'll be the same with these boys in years to come. You know, that we became really close really quickly, and I think. I hear these managers saying, oh, you've got to get a distance with your players. I couldn't think anything worse. You know, I think the part, we're judged on the performance of others, the managers. Yeah. You're, you're judged on who you sign now and who you, so it's, it's your job to try and you get, know, the best out of them. get the best out of them. And be, doing that is by, it's like beating a parent, you know, you can do on them when they need to do them, but you give them a cuddle and encouragement at the right time as well. Everybody, the whole Scottish football almost wanted, it seemed like everybody wanted the ferry to, uh, up yeah, yeah. to, to win the league and go up. Was that hard for you though to, because so, they, they just didn't go away, didn't you know? Mm. Or did you use it? Every you want just to get it? Oh, really? I think uh, we, we were just kind of hell-bent on sorting out ourselves, sorting out our own business. We didn't want to depend on anybody. And we've seen the love in for a growth and, you know, we got that. I got that. You know, it is a good story. Um, you look at it a wee bit deeper, you know, that team has been built over three years. Mm. I was trying to put a squad together over three months, really. Um, so they had the benefit of having all that. They're well paid part time players. The majority of them could be full time if they wanted to, but they choose not to be. And, you know, there's so much good about a growth. And you can see that story developing and how everybody wanted it. But, you know, for us, it was just all about, um, I was there. It, my responsibility was to get Kamala. I knew who I was representing. I knew who I was depending on me and who was depending on us. And that superseded everything. And we never really let that come into it. We never really mentioned other teams, to be yeah. honest. We just try to. So see when managers say like, didn't even look at the results, that's a lie, isn't it? Of course it is. Aye, and, I, and you see that. And Were you expecting them to fall sooner, Dale? No, I thought, do you know what? I thought a both would win their home games. Yeah. Um, their away form was still pretty impressive, but they weren't winning as many in the road, but they weren't losing. Um, and we just, I had done the mass. I felt when we went in, we needed to, to have 10 wins. I thought six to eight points would win the league. And I was what privately said that um, in the day of the staff. So we were working towards 68 points and 10 wins and my 10th win was home to Abroad. So, and normally in any walk of life, you're going to have to beat your closest challengers to be successful and Abroad were our, because we beat Partey at home, we beat Inverness at home, we beat Wraith. So slowly but surely we started to get away from them. But ultimately, if you don't beat your closest challengers, you normally don't win. So mm. we had, it was all in that game, to be honest, you know, so, and we didn't deal with the first half, but second half, you no, know, a true reflection of what I expected is turn up and, got the job done it was a proper finish and you know you couldn't have scripted it any better for no. Kamala it's a great game man so, some night that even the atmosphere was amazing right? uh, the, the, the stadium was full but do you I still think I've got a chance of going up yeah so honest. do I do you because they're both like you say, like, I, two legs. they don't lose many goals they're same that familiarity at the back um, you know McKenna's a good player Jack Hamilton can get goals they're well, they're well set up. So I wouldn't, you wouldn't back against them. They have that playoff shot. Mm -hmm. Are they tough to play against? 
it's, aye, it's tougher up there, and that's why I was annoyed with our first half performance because we'd spoke all week about trying to play a certain way, try to stretch the game, try to play on the outside of them, and and ask the question of them, um, try to bypass really a lot of the time their, their, their two banks of four and really make them move. And we didn't really do it. We, we, we got caught up in the emotion of the game, I thought, first half. And then we lose a goal, which sets everybody back, you know what I mean? Mm. But second half, I actually thought, right for the outset, we uh, we we battered them second half. We did, we did. We dominated the ball. We, we kept asking the question. And I felt if we scored the first goal well enough, we'd, uh, we would win the game. And that's how it played out. But, you know, they've got so, many, so much good going for them. I, I respected the league. There's a lot of teams in the league who I've got a high regard for, you know, managers and and the, and the players. And we didn't pretend we were wholly better than MDLs. We had work today. We had to convince every day. But more more importantly, we had to convince <coughs> the players to, that were good enough. Uh-huh. How's Dick on the side? Hard work. Do you know what? I don't know. I mean, you watch him when you watch games and he can be a bit animated. But, you know, first half he always watches up. In the stand, stand doesn't he? That. And to be honest, second half, I didn't, I wasn't, I don't really notice too much. Uh-huh. The dugouts. Because um, it was the players after the game, somebody said that you were the calmest guy in the dressing room at halftime. I was going to ask his team to talk off time. Well, it was bedlam and it was obviously panic because it's like we've got 45 minutes to it becomes a 45 minute game now. Mm-hmm. You know, everything we'd worked on all week and we were flying in it. Training was was great, you know. But sometimes and you'll get this as a man, you'll never training's never always an indication. It can give you an indication of it, but we had such a good week to prep, we'd get Rory McKenzie back, we wanted to make sure we get in the team. So I felt we were right, everything was right for the game, but we hadn't played. So uh, second half, it was just a wee reminder of the players at half time that, you know, to get back to what we were, we were spoke about. And sometimes, you know, the emotion, the, the bedlam that goes on, probably the enormity of, we're making an ass of this, we're, we're not going to win this and mm. that will kill us and, you know, the fallout for all that. And once you, half time came at the right time for us because I needed to, to be able to say that to them and, and just say, look, just, Start passing the ball and training. You stick it to each other. Guys up your ass. You just still take responsibility. And right for the outset, you like to see him again and you're mm-hmm. all Mackenzie's. We started to play and um, we got our goals, thankfully. It's an achievement, mate. Isn't it? uh-huh. Brilliant. How was the night? What did you do after it? We were pretty quiet. My my wife and my oldest boy were down. My old is that is Jack your oldest now? Jack, yeah. Uh-huh. So Jack was down. Uh, he was busting to get involved and have a drink, but he had to drive my car home. So, um, with a few beers, the players were lively and I think they went on into Kilmarnock, but, um, Doc and Peanut had, um, they drove up, up the road back to Broughty Ferry. I was quiet, really. Um, went up to the boardroom with a couple of beers afterwards, uh, when we were out of dressing room. And then we'd, we'd already set in place. Um, players never knew, but we were all meeting Sunday. Um, so we're having brunch, breakfast, uh, liquid breakfast at the club. Oh, um, yeah, and he beat a little bit of breakfast, didn't you? Uh, so every we, Sunday we'll do it. So we um <laughs> Friday as well. So we set up eleven o'clock, probably part in one of the suites, all the boys together and then we went into a beer garden come on so and then up the tune. So it was good to celebrate every day together, do you know what I mean? So, Sensational. And then the boys they're away in Spain the now. Oh, yeah. Really, yeah, I was throwing all sorts of, sorts of them. We'll get you a holiday, we'll get you a bonus. <laughs> Just win the league, league yeah. <laughs> we burkey's t shirt and the pill, on it. We ginger, aye. Aye. We aye. Aye. He's not away. He's, oh, not he? away. No, he's too sensible. He's, he's, that, he's coaching the 18, he's helping the 18s at the minute. So, uh, good. He's uh, he's not away. No, it's nice. Need to ask you about Lafferty, mate. I've interviewed him, met him a couple of times. Funny, funny boy. What is what is a conversation like with Kyle Lafferty when you're trying to convince him to sign for a football club? Do you know what? It's a. Uh, you hear all the stories um, about Kyle. I, I'd actually tried to take him to Bristol City. Um, he might not remember it. Um, and obviously he's not a tighter striker. You, a boy he could take to Aberdeen. But I always admired him. Um, he's, uh, and I thought he'd be great for us. So when, I, when we met the first time, I um, sneaked him in the door and I said, look, uh, how do you feel about it? He said, no, I would like to come back and all the rest of it. And I'd spoke to a few people involved in the Northern Ireland setup, and they said, look, Kyle, we could write a million stories about Kyle. You know what I mean? And, he says, but there is a switch with him. Come game day, there's a switch with him. He's, he's on it. He'll give you and he's, he, he produces for you. And I felt that. I mean, you don't play 87 times for Northern yeah. Ireland without having been a level of player. But, you know, he, he is like a 34-year-old Wayne, Monday <laughs> Friday. And sometimes you need to kind of, you hear what's going on and, and all the rest of it. But I'm talking about that personality. I, I, I would never shy away from signing boys like yeah. that. I love boys like that. You know, I signed Jody Morris, Michael Dubry boys. They had a wee bit of reputation, a wee bit... But all these boys were, were brilliant. And laugh, I would put in the same kind of category as, um, you no, know, he's, uh, he, he, he always keeps you on your toes. But I, I think he's respectful enough. 
um, to his work and what he needs to do but a brilliant teammate so popular with the boys mm. 30 year old Ben sounds like 34 year old yes. he is I know how you feel Dale I'm going to look after him <laughs> some managers don't shy away for characters like I had definitely do why are you trying to this feel challenged or see when you go on all these LMA courses and they'll all say how to deal with that maverick player the one maybe it's not always it's maybe the one personality one that doesn't do doesn't conform to everything or maybe the one the team who doesn't work as hard as anybody else and you would never aim that at laugh laugh what's hard he trains he's tra people used to say to me oh no train no train Thursday Friday trained all the time for me so whether that's him whether well, there's a change in him from what we got but he's uh, he's really responded he's he stepped up and then the big games you know these types of people you need them you know mm -hmm. it's like the bigger the games the bigger the performance mm. you get some boys who are training ground at the Nationals Monday to Friday and then you don't see him on a Saturday because I always think laugh turns up you mm. know what I mean he, he's there I was definitely one of them training grounds Were you? Monday to Friday uh, I'm obsessed nothing with... worse as a manager as well well I, I've loads of players over the years that worked with and you could be convinced to play them through their training there's also boys who I've worked with I'm thinking like, do you know what don't look at their training because they'll be alright Saturday um, and it's hard that because yeah. every bone in your body says you need to train better he's murder or any chance but then a Saturday turns up he's the one that gets you to go I had a few like that um, at St Johnston a few like that uh, as a manager at different times and sometimes I've always had the feeling that you can't always play your way into the team through your training you know what I mean because the team might be doing well and there's somebody better than you in that position but you can play your way out of the team yeah. someday if, if you're not training right and you're cutting corners and you're having a lazy day and I'll no stand for, I'll no accept bad practice. I'll no, I, I like to carry on, I like to laugh and a joke with my team, but when it gets to that stage where bad practice and, and disrespectful to the, whoever the coach is delivering it, it's not happening. Yeah. So people have got to train right, they've got to accept the demand of what we're doing, but sometimes there's boys who just don't train as train well. You know, there's boys who, a lot of the quicker players on the wee tight possessions and that, yeah. I thought it was a I've never kicked a ball before. You know, and I played with boys like that and yeah. I've managed boys like that. But come a Saturday, bigger pitch, big occasion, we deal with the game. Mm -hmm. Big names, I love hearing about the big names, Dubray and Morris. Brilliant. Morris was a player, wasn't he? Aye, Jody was brilliant. I, I was a few big time shouts with you. I think there was a time he was, Jody was, would have been a bit leery and all the rest yeah. of it. You know what I mean? But he was a boy, wasn't he? At Chelsea, he grew up in a, a, a big era. And, but I was, I went to Millwall when Jody was injured. He'd done his cruise shit and um, he was in the gym all the time dedicated, battered himself, you know, yeah. he was a fit boy and we became really tight and friends and then obviously when I left Millwall, come back to St Johnson, got the job, I said to Jody, um, he, he wasn't playing and I said, why come up and do his turn? And I said, uh, it's 700 quid a week and he's like, don't worry about the money. I says, can you get my flight to get back to see Lou and the kids every couple of weeks? I said, aye, we'll put up your accommodation. So I says to Jeff Brown, can we, can we bring him up? And he went, aye, just go and get it done. And what a sign he was. He, he was he ran yeah. the dressing room. Nice in that. Small in stature, but walk into the dressing room, he, he owned it. Mm -hmm. He everybody respected him. Uh, the softest feet to play, calmest, running to Park Key, running to Ibrox, had his cell. No, there was nothing facing. Chest was it, man. Uh, he was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Do you see when you um, left Aberdeen, were you actually to get straight back into a job or did you actually feel the time? You benefited for that? No, I wasn't itching. Um, I actually had a couple of opportunities, more or less, right away. Um, a, a good League One club in England um, had offered us a chance to come in, uh, and it was only a week. And I thought, do you know what? No, I need. I felt as if um, I was looking forward to the break. To be honest, I think sometimes when you're 14 years constant as manager, you were eight years at Aberdeen, and I was all in at Aberdeen. I loved Aberdeen. You know, mm -hmm. it's. I mean, there's a lot of. Um, if you believe how certain people's stories of how it played out but Aberdeen was so good to me so rewarding and so enjoyable to yeah. be honest it was a brilliant story for, for seven and, and a bit years it was a brilliant story the, the way it played out at the end was disappointing but it doesn't always finish well mm -hmm. for people so um, but by and large it was brilliant but I actually felt you know from the outside once I was on the outside I'm thinking you know, although Covid was still there with travel restrictions and stuff just wanted to go and get a couple of breaks and, and spend a bit of time with the family. So I was 10 years really away, almost two years at Bristol, eight years at Aberdeen. So you're travelling all the time. So as a consequence of that, you know, yeah. you're, you're just constantly working. You know, you just felt I was an Aberdeen manager. You know so did you just stay in Aberdeen? So I stayed uh, a couple of nights during the week up at Stonehaven. I had a place here. My wife would come up on a Friday for the home games. And again, all my family were, you know, supported it. It was yeah. like right into it. You know, we, um, and you don't, 
you don't invest yourself a club like that uh, for so long because Aberdeen never keep managers that length of time, mm. you know. So, um, but there's different ways of um, take real pride in how we managed to be so consistent, so good, four second place finishes. And we would have been a fifth second place if it hadn't been Steve McLean referee game Mother will go in my first year, obviously. Ridiculous decision. <laughs> is that the one they got in Europe last day? Was it Craig Reed that scored? Aye. Craig right. Reed putting you to Europe. Is that his... Jamie Langfield got absolutely <laughs> smashed last minute injury time. So it'd been five second yeah. place finishes in eight years. Um so that was good going. We cup final after cup final, Europe every year. But it's not just a trophy. I know we only won one trophy and fans, you know, tangible success, it's trophies in it, and that's what it's a bugbear we didn't yeah. do more and we come up against Rogers, Brendan Rogers to sell it team who were, were outstanding um on all of the occasions and it, we fell short but there was other opportunities. But I look at how do you judge success? It's like I look at the international team that's full of boys that we developed and worked with. Um we Jacko and Scott Wright playing a European semi final night, Ken McLean, Ryan Christie now and playing the Premier League, yeah, you know, mm-hmm. Shinny, mm-hmm. Big McKenna probably make a chance going to the Premier League. So You've made boys better as well as getting second place finishes. And it is, yeah, it's yeah. like developing players, yeah. working close with players, but the prize money, we were bringing in millions every year to Aberdeen on prize money, millions, um, you know, through league performance, league position, um, guaranteed European games at home, maybe two or three of them, semi-finals, cup finals, constantly bringing money into the club. So, you know, it was a good story there and working with good people. It was a proper club, work, everybody working together for the chairman, to uh, the girls in the kitchen, the cleaners, uh, stadium managers, everybody, we all worked brilliantly. It was a good story. We turned, mm. we got a good thing going up at Aberdeen and, uh, you know, I'm not having this how it played out in a section of the fans, then they like it. Uh, as always the case. When you're there too long, sometimes people just get fed up with your mm. voice and change is good, you know, and, and I felt that it was probably the right time to move as well, but I was hoping to wait to the end of the season, but didn't get the luxury of that. Um, <clears throat> and this whole thing about, um, the style and all the rest of it. We had, we've had we always had a good team at Aberdeen. We've, we've never changed style. What we did have the last season, people say, ah, oh, the last year wasn't a great style. And we lost Cosgrove um, to injury in pre-season, done his, his knee. But that's that summer we lost McKenna to Forest for a few mm. million quid. And then we sold Sam Cosgrove and we did get him back fit. We sold him for a couple of million in the January. But up until that, uh, that season, we were getting plaudits for how we were playing. It was Hedges, Scott Wright, and Marley Watkins behind McCrory, uh, in front of McCrory and Ferguson. That, that five centrally were outstanding. Yeah. Um, we were sitting, I think, on Boxing Day at the halfway stage in third place on 38 points. Now, if you put that in equation of how well Hearts have done this year, they were in the same games, 33 points this year. So we were doing all right, mm. but all of a sudden it was like, wasn't it good enough? All of a sudden it wasn't good enough to to be where we were and we needed more. And we lost Scott Wright uh, with a double hair there. We lost Hedges with injury and then eventually sold Scott Wright and then we lost Marley Watkins in the semi-final in Celtic. And we needed help in January. Yeah, tough, and yeah. We never got help. I never got help in January. We, we identified the players and if we had got the help we needed in the January, we would have finished third. There's mm. no question. Um, but we didn't. And, uh, and time moves on. You know, you've got to move on. I think when, change, when clubs change owner, they're normally a change of manager and that's just fitter. Even that with your the six players that you've mentioned in your midfield attack, but you always had two fullbacks that would get high as well, Shane yeah. Morgan. So you're, you're always attacking with eight players. We tried to, you know, and latterly when we played a back five that last year with Johnny as a wing back. back uh-huh. And we play a lot of time like a winger at right wing back, yeah. whether it was me, Matty Kennedy or um uh, Conor McLaren. We we tried to be as positive as we could. So with three centre backs, um it gives us a size in the team and give us that wee bit of protection. But we tried to play a wee bit more off the cuff and we tried to play um, with a bit more freedom and a bit more pace in the team um, with what we had. And, that, and to be honest, it was working. We were third, as I said mm. to you, up until that stage. But we needed help because Cosgrove was leaving and we needed we needed a number nine. We were lacking in goals in and, and that last wee period and we were limping towards January, to be honest, and we needed to bring people in. I'd identified people to bring in and we never managed to get them in. Uh, you said you were wanting the break, but you surprised how long it took to get back in? Uh, no, because I, I genuinely, uh, um, no surprise, because there was other few other things had came up, but I kind of batted them away. I was I, I was applied for one job uh, uh, down the road that I was close to getting um, uh, at Ipswich. I'd, I'd nearly right. got that one. Um, and that kind you of ended up getting that Paul Cook, was it? 
No, Cookie's my mate. No, he, it's when he lost his job, Cookie. Right. Um, oh, the boy from Kieran McKenna. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, so I'd, um, I was pretty close to getting that one. Um, but it was again moving for the family and all the rest of it. And I don't know if I was ready for it. I think what, I, what it did tell me being out was I was enjoying being home all the time. Mm. Um, being able to just be spontaneous, uh, go and play golf with the boys, be able to share the load with the training, um, all the demands that they've got and all the rest of it. So it was good being home every day. So, um, I actually wasn't itching to get back. I was doing plenty of stuff for TV. I was getting my wee fix for that. But towards the last maybe few weeks, I was getting a wee bit of dugout envy, going to games and looking at the managers around the game and thinking, it's maybe time to get back in. And mm. Kamarnock were, were uh, good enough to give me that opportunity. And and uh, once they'd spoke to me and once they'd offered me, I, I, it felt right again. I said, right, I need to get my hands dirty again, get back to what? His hands are constantly dirty. It's all the time. <laughs> Heard that. <laughs> Heard that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, it drives me crazy though, now, right? But people are so obsessed with talking about we want to play this right way of playing, style of playing, all that, right? And then maybe there's some of the other lean fans this style of play. But I, there's been many managers that have come into this season, into Scotland, who have supposedly got this amazing style of play, but can they create any chances, don't score goals, and can they win games? It's, it's kind of went a bit crazy now, the, the way people talk Every manager's got their, I mean, for all the pomp and fanfare about what they were going to do at Aberdeen after I left, um, you know, it, for, where, where's it been? They're now onto their second manager, we goody, and, and going in there. So, and I think it is a bit dangerous to set yourself up to say, I'm not just talking about Aberdeen, I'm talking in general, as you say, Slaney, but well, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. Your job's to win games, you know what I mean? And, and ideally, you would like to, I think your job as a manager is to help the team, whatever you've got in the dressing room, is to try and, right, get these boys winning games. Mm. Um, and ideally, you would maybe, I like to have pace in my team. I like to have enough pace in the team that can cause teams problems, even the threat of pace. Mm -hmm. um, you like to have passes. People said that, but my Aberdeen teams were, were proper teams. You know, you don't have, you don't play long ball or direct when you've got Kenny McLean, Graham Shinney, Ryan Jack, Ryan Christie, yeah. James Madison, Gary Mackay, Stevens, Now McGinn, Johnny Hayes. You know, yeah. you've got to find a way to isolate your pace in the team. You've got good passes in the team. Um, but at times you've got to be pragmatic and get the job done. And, you know, if it means playing a certain way to get over the line, then so be it. And I, speak to, I spoke to David Moyes a couple of months ago and he was saying how, you know, it's almost as if he's seen as a bit of a dinosaur at times because his centre-halves don't take the ball for the goal in the six-yard box. Mm -hmm. And he says this whole rule of thumb that the defenders are now the guys, and you watch the game in England, who get the most touches and they get you the ball. You can see that on Sky Sports now. And we used, touches, to always, yeah. we used to always have, look, get defenders to get the ball and they can play. And, uh, you know, it's almost kind of turned on its, its head that, um, you know, I think what he had said, Davey said, you've got defenders who know, who are footballers, maybe midfielders' feet, but maybe don't know how to defend the way traditional defenders defended. So you're asking fullbacks to be 50 yards for them, centre-halves to be split. And then when they're asked to defend, they don't have the capacity to deal with it. So mm -hmm. if you've got good defenders, 1v1 defenders, then you can be a wee bit braver with your setup. If you want, if you've got um, players with pace at the back, you can go with that high press. Pace, so yeah. it's whatever you've got. And I look at managers a lot of the time up and down the country when I'm watching games and I see them obsessed with how they want to play. They've clearly set up and worked on how to play Monday to Friday. But when it's no going right and their players are looking for help and they're not getting it, the managers still get this kind of, no arrogance is maybe too bad, but this kind of, this kind of opinion, or this is the way we do it, yeah, this yeah. is the way, it, wait a minute mate, your team's getting scudded again, <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> Deal with the game to help your players out, it's not yeah. about you. Yeah, yeah. And too many I think, think it's about them. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you would never like to see Aberdeen den, den bad, but does, do you almost feel vindicated with the season that they've had? Do you know what? I vindicated is a good word for me than that. He's on the sheet though. That is on the sheet. sheet. Um, <laughs> I think he's, I think that, you know, the standards have, have clearly dropped and that's why there's obviously been a couple of changes now. And, um, but, you know, there's good players there, you know, and there's um, good opportunity for, a, for Jim now to go in and put his own stamp on things. But there's good players there. I'm still, still close with a lot of players, still close with a lot of the, the support staff, the playing staff and, um, a, um, stadium staff and all the rest of it. So I know it's been a frustrating season. Um, but it just shows you, you know, in Aberdeen, regardless of what budget's afforded to you and all the benefits you get, you've got to use it right. You've got to still, recruitment's got to be good, good decisions got to be made. And it's the same up and down all over with football clubs. I was, I think Aberdeen had been twice in Europe in 10 years before we got there. So this isn't a, if you don't work right as a club Monday to Friday, if you don't get, make good decisions made, then, 
sometimes you don't deliver what you want to deliver and what you expected of you. And, you know, what, what you managed to do was try to, I think, u- utilise what was afforded to us with better resources at St Johnston, better budget. Um, you then take the benefit of that and try and get better players. But it's um, it's no easy. It's no easy keeping good players. We mm. had to re- I talk about it, I was every a massive year. rebuild. We had a rebuild every year. Yeah. Do you know what crazy, I mean? And that's the job as a manager. You, good players and good teams normally get normally get taken away from you. you know? mm. And that was what was constantly happening. So uh, it's, it has been disappointing for them. But, you know, it, I'm... I need, I'm moved on for Aberdeen. Ah, I've, had my time. I've had my time. My my job is a commander and what's next for me and working with, with my club now. So, But I look back with real pride. There's none of this. No matter, people say certain things about how it ended and all the rest of it. Um, you can't change. The, the narrative was a good story. We were a good story at Aberdeen and they don't tell me any different. No matter how close you are with people said, you and Craig Brown still got three nights a week. <laughs> I don't speak to Craig much. No, I, don't, I, don't. Still, uh, no, I don't. Um, but I still go off with Stuart Milne and um, speak, t- keep in touch with directors and stuff, and you know you don't you don't work at a club for eight years and you don't build good relationships. You know what I mean, what about players wise? Who was good characters? Right, at your time up at Aberdeen, who was good for you? Uh, Matt Reynolds, uh, Adam Rooney. You know, Rooney. Rooney's uh, a good boy, um, isn't he? Boring as fuck, but a good boy. Uh, Sh- Shinny, Ryan Jack, um, all the boys. Big McKenna was a great boy. McKenna at sixteen, you just knew. You just knew he was the right boy. He was always with a kit man. He was the last hauling hof- in all the gear for training. Um, trained with short sleeves, black boots. Just did everything right. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He just he wanted good things to happen for him and he was always a good boy. And um, he, he there was no real surprise with him. And he was a bit old school that way, whereas a lot of the young ones now are more interested in their... The followers and the toilet bags and all the all the bollocks that comes that. with that, and their that biggest influences a lot of times are their agents and their buds rather than just their coaches and their, their um, senior players. You yeah, know? I, I like I like um, senior players to take an interest in the young boys and develop relationships like that. We always tried to foster that at Aberdeen and create that kind of culture. Um, so we get the senior players to take an interest in the kids. So it was like centre forward Rooney with a young striker, Rooney and Bruce Anderson, or midfielders with a midfielder. And just try and build that relationship and take an interest in them. As um, long as Adam Rooney wasn't teaching them first touch. He's no. <laughs> no. You said that. <laughs> but we always, see the thing with Rooney is we always... Great guy, man. Uh, I, and he scored three seasons yeah. in a row, 20 odd goals. And for a free transfer, um, he's up there with you know, the best, one of the best signs ever made. I loved mm. Adam Rooney. And a lot of the time, your main striker, we talk about that um, in um, Monday to Friday training and stuff like that. Um, but Rooney was, he always felt he's going to pitch he always had in his head I'll get three or four chances and the thing about him when he missed his first one it didn't bother him it bothered him he never scored but he was always ready for the next one and it's almost as if and I mean this with the greatest respect to Adam we played with with ten men and Rooney (laughs) we needed to get Rooney and Adam wouldn't always get you up the pitch taking it in or running or being big enough but you wouldn't want MDL so in the end of things I mean he was different class for me what about his brother Johnny his (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Johnny, we Isa, we call him, we Isa, him and oh, I was, How's he, have you got it? Oh, he's always got stories, oh, do you hear this, do you hear this? <laughs> jo- Johnny's got a two minute window with me, I can't understand him anyway, but um, he uh, he asked, he sent me a message the other day, they're asking me to say, right, a wee testimonial for him for his CV, for his doing his coaching badges and it. And I just put, Johnny Hayes is fast. And that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but no, he's, uh, he was brilliant for me in both spells, Johnny. Uh-huh. Uh, he came back with a different mentality, obviously, having won things at Celtic and the demand on Celtic. But he's still as quick as ever. And a big part of the dressing room, he was a brilliant boy for me. I remember the first day, uh, first game at Aberdeen towards the end of the season. And uh, I'd, I'd just about to name the team. And he went doing as he does, the wee bit of drama queen, Johnny. He's, in training, he's like holding his ankle. I'm, like, I'm stunned out of him. Fizzles running on. I was just about to name a team day set players. My first game for Aberdeen. I says, You all right? And he's like, Yeah, yeah. I says, Come on, fuck. I says, I'm building my team around about you tomorrow. I says, I need you to play. And he looked at me and they gave you the job. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so he was good character, Johnny. He was uh, life and soul. I was pretty keeping the hydro, mate, and we met him at Sign. I'm a He came up to mate. me, right? And I could not understand a yeah. fucking word yeah. he Did said you know? to me. No, he just kept talking about how great. He boy. mumbles, doesn't he? Hi, mumbles. mumbles. Yeah, he mumbles. See, so I remember I played against Ryan Jack when I was young, right? We, we sort of competed against each other, but I never thought. Do he, he remembers it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, Joe, <laughs> we should never asked that. <laughs> Robert, did you could, see him when he was at Aberdeen? Did you think he was going to go on? Because he's a real leader for Rangers now, isn't he? Uh, no, I think uh, what you say it's like playing against Aberdeen with St Johnston. Mm. I always recognised he was a decent player, but he always seemed to be right back when he played mm. against us. And uh, we first went in, uh, and I loved him right away. I just loved the way he was demanding and training. Um, Back to it, people get frustrated with people not doing things right. Took the ball. He was your best player on training. He was everybody's first pass. I'm thinking, love this boy. At times, you could have had a bigger Ranger pass at times mm. at that age, I felt. But he kept the ball for you. It's total trust. I mean, Russell Anderson, his captain. Russell was a great captain and a, a natural captain. But after that first season, um, Russell was retiring. And I had a decision to make. And I just um, I said to Jack, I says, you're you were the captain building the team around about you, a set midfielder. But as soon as we went in, we made him set midfielder. Um, and he was a great captain. I mean, the only thing is, every time I made somebody captain, the, 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 so, so Jacko left and then Shinny left. But, uh, but brilliant. Jacko, um, he makes teams better. He made my Aberdeen team better. He makes Rangers better. I think he makes Scotland better, to be honest. I know mm -hmm. Scotland are well um, looked after in midfield, but uh, Jack would play my stock Scotland team as well. I need to ask you about two other players that have just sprung to my mind because oh. you've said about having good older pros, Barry Robson, Willow Flood. Well, two they were, characters, aren't they? Well, we, we looked at Aberdeen. I remember when we went in and Craig and Archie were still taking the team and I went to Tannadice to watch the last game before the split and whoever won it was in top six. And uh, so Doc was actually doing watching Sheffield United, watching Barry. Against Barry, who, sorry, Robson right. against Crew because and I think I was I went to Tannadice, so I'm watching the game and we well I was trampling all over that in midfield right. He single handedly drove Dundee United into top six. He mm. was all the game, um, fiery, narky, but good on the ball, getting forward, winning tackles, and Aberdeen were passive on the day. A huge support down at Tannadice and Aberdeen ended up in the bottom six. And I jumped into the motor and I phoned Dot. I says, Willow's my first signing. I said, tell me about Robson, because I played with Barry Rangers, the young boy, yeah. the Rangers, and I had him at Dundee United, played with him at Dundee United. He says, how was Robson? He went, murder, murder. Couldn't tell you to sign him. He says, he played him in the time, and we tell Barry this all the time. <laughs> um, so I phoned Willow's agent on the way home. I said, I want to meet Willow. So I went to Willow's house on the Monday. Um, he says, come to the house, four o'clock. I went in. He wasn't obviously prepared for me coming. I was dirty washing everywhere in the house. He always looks like fucking knackered Willow as well, didn't he? Uh, but I, I, I just felt I need to get this boy. And we probably had to go a couple hundred quid more to get him. Uh, but we got him. But I took the 200 quid half Barry's off. I didn't give it to Willow. <laughs> oh, you hate that, man. <laughs> so, but, sitting with Barry. So, so I went with Willow. And I used to take, I used to go and meet either at Stuart Milne's house at Glen Eagles with players for trying to sign him, try to give him the big okay. sale and impressive uh, or nice hotel or whatever. And I met Barry for signing talks in Nashville, Chippy in Aberdeen. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I made him pay for it. So we're sitting <laughs> and he's going, aye, so that's me back with uh, my season of kids and just um, getting the kids into school. We've bought a house in Inverurie. I'm like, keep talking, keep talking. And he's like, can I get two years? I'm not going to need two years. I'll give you a year. He's like, oh, come on. I need two years. A wee bit of security. I says, no. He says, well, I might have other options. He says, you just bought a house. You've got to school. <laughs> the wings are going to school. Where are you going to go? He went, aye, all right. And I says, I have no money. You need to pay for this chip. <laughs> so he tells the story. He says, all the other ones get spoiled. He says, I didn't even give my dinner pay for. So he signed and Barry was brilliant. Um, what a player, man. Do you know what? I, I love Barry. Yeah. I, um, the one game where uh, it's quite synonymous with Barry because he, he always, him and Willow always took responsibility. They didn't give a shit if the fans were booing it on each. Yeah. Fans were on their back. And a lot of people, you're talking about that, people, boys disappearing. Uh, you know, it's difficult playing at Aberdeen at home and things aren't going well. Um, and the fans expect more. But Willow would give the ball away, but then just go and get it again. He would just constantly take responsibility. And Robson was the same. Robson um, was brilliant for me to tour him. Barry used to always say, Aye, Russell Anderson's a great captain. He can sort the tickets. I'll take the boys down the tunnel. <laughs> <laughs> um, but he was a brilliant personality. And when it came to the end, um, obviously I had Shinny, Jacko, Willow, Kenny, McLean, Barry, every other Monday, champ the door. I'm like, what? And he's like, I just think I can get in the team. I think I can start something off. And I'm like, instead of who? Yeah. You know, who you got? And he's like, no, but... Um, That's brilliant, isn't it? Brilliant. So, and see, to be honest, I used to get him to play in the reserve team. It's up at Peter Heed, the reserve games. And he didn't even know, it was just a subconscious thing, but he was developing other players. He was brilliant for McKenna, you know, playing with the young boys. And I do think there is a place for senior players playing in youth teams and, you know, in under 23 teams, because bringing them on, he didn't even know, he was, he was just being him. Yeah. He was actually bringing on the next generation of players. And 
and I needed to, I wanted to keep him. I, we actually created a role for him and the club were good to support me on that because I didn't have a place in the staff, but I didn't want to let him go. It was good uh, to pick up the cones after every session, wasn't it? That role you created uh, for him, that was he, good. He, he was I played good. against you in reserves when I was about 16 year old, you don't even remember it, you at United. You said he was brilliant, didn't you? Oh, that's what I'm saying, it was only, and you played against older guys like that, you learn more than that 90 minutes and you do fucking five years. See, I think, I think we've senior. lost a bit of that, yeah. to be honest. I remember one of my first reserve games for Morton. Um, Celtic sent down a team on a Tuesday and it was like Alan McKnight, Mick McCarthy, Paul McStay, Mark McGee, Owen Archdeacon, Tony Shepard, riddled with top players. Um, and you actually think you come out of it, how shite am I? <laughs> anyway, you're playing against Paul <laughs> McStay, miles off it. But that whole playing the reserve team um, in the Premier League, Morton in the Premier League, playing against good players, that that's worth its weight in gold, you know what I mean, for development for young players. And I think I do think you need to expose young players, you need to test them, you need to stretch them, don't let them get comfortable. And I think academy football all becomes a bit too mm -hmm. a bubble and insular. It's the same boys playing against the same boys for each team for years and years and years. And we need to find a way to challenge them there. That's a managerial clinic, isn't it? He's brilliant. He really is. I can see why he's been successful everywhere. But see when it comes down to manager size and, and when it comes to your former managers, have you took any of their sort of style into your management? I just want to be a manager that I would have wanted to play for. I, I look at people now, even guys I didn't ma manage to um, play under, people talking, and I'm going, I'd love to have played for him. Mm -hmm. You know, and there's other ones, you, you hear them blagging on, spluffing, and going, I wouldn't know for me, I couldn't have played for him. You mm -hmm. know, and, and I think that I was lucky, I had a great development with Alan McGraw, and I'll think back at Morton. You know, he was, he was restricted with his knees and stuff like that, but you know, taking the time with me to, uh, after games, sitting on a Monday with a cup of tea in his office. You know, sometimes a young boy, you're looking for the door to get out, right, is this over now? You know what I mean? And, but he'd make you feel so comfortable and give you the confidence. And he would get through chapter and verse, your performance in the game. And even when you were murdered and made mistakes, he would make you feel you were better than what you actually were. And that's, that's brilliant. That for me, any manager who took the time to invest in me and took the time to speak to me and, and believe in me, that made me feel hundred feet tall, do you know what yeah. I mean? worth everything. And we've got a saying with the staff and like make them make them feel important. Make the so before we go, I've got always got to tap my training sheet before we go for training, make them feel important. And and that's your job is to try and get performances out of boys. And uh, Walter Smith was was a master at that. You know, I mean I just needed a well done for him. See we just yeah. said to the guy we just went, well done, that made me that was me made up. Mm, Didn't he made yeah. I because I've had satisfied him and Gary Megson was another one who for a manager who actually for, he'd rinsed everything out of our squad for us to win that first promotion at West Brom to the Premier League when there was so many other teams with far more resource and the rest of it that's proper management he was hard on us he was um, he never let up he was proper on us all the time never seemed to be satisfied never seemed to be happy but he was relentless with his demands on us and we were the fittest team, the hardest working team and we ended up going up with Man City and, and, and the Premier League and I still to this day, I can't, I can't have enough uh, praise for him how he managed to get us up there. He was yeah. outstanding. Uh, Walter Smith, obviously, he's brilliant. Well, you've talked about man management a lot. Was uh, the brilliance of him that he could look after personalities like Gascoigne, McCoist? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, you know? he, he didn't appreciate really the challenges he would have had. You know, I, I'd always heard good things about the gaffer when, and when I went to Rangers. You Do know, you remember him asking you to sign for Rangers though? Aye. What, aye. So you just sat in your house? No, no. Uh, so there was... Um, I knew Rangers had been watching us and I was all set to go down south um, and then Rangers came in and because I had a clause in the contract, it came a wee bit messy for Morton at the end up, but because I had a clause, because I'd felt that Morton had asked for too much money and denied me opportunities before, when I re-signed, I, I put that clause in and Rangers met the clause. So while Morton were getting more money for other teams, I wanted to go to Rangers. Um, so when I was due to meet Walter, I, I, my, my dad was a huge Rangers fan and, and I asked him to come along with me. I mean, I think back even now, just that people touch. I mean, he's a huge manager by that stage. He'd done so much and he was dealing with key players, you say. But when he brought me in, um, in his office up the stairs, and I was never in that office again. It was only the bad boys that went up there. You know, he never really go into the gaffer's office up the stairs at the top of the staircase. Um, and he came in and he said, uh, right, Derek, you go away with the physios and get your medical. He says, I'll, I'll sit with your dad. And when I came back in, it's about half eleven. There's my dad sitting with water, having a can of lager, the two of them. 
No way. Aye, and I'm thinking, I'm like my dad. You did. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's like, oh, Walter's. I'm like, Walter, aye, you go to school then? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and I'm thinking, the two of them, no, and Walter made him feel at home. He just kind of, I think he recognised it was a big deal. Your dad. So I mean, for my dad. And that means a lot, to be honest. When I think back at that, just those, that we touch, I was away getting a medical. God knows who I passed the medical because my knees were short, but I uh, was away for a couple of hours and then I came back and my dad had the ball. Do you know what I mean? So, um, it meant a lot that so and Walter had that about him that kind of human side you know and you know I had a couple of um, um, I wasn't as close to him as other players were because um, I always felt I had his trust um, I always felt as though that if I was fit and I had loads of injuries that he liked me being there and then about things but there was always better players ahead of me in the starting team but but I remember I'd played every round of the League Cup um, we had, and I'd been involved in every league game that, that year as well either starting or on the bench in the 9-0 season we played the League Cup final against Hearts and I remember I was sitting, that was the time when there was only three subs and one was always a goalie. So I remember we were sitting at the meeting at half one at Ibrox and it was me, Big, uh, Big Oz and Charlie and the three of us were sitting. And we're doing the mass here going, by the way, a couple of us are not going to go on the bench here. And then I says to me, Charlie, and I says, why, why don't we split two bonuses amongst the three years? And me, Charlie, had a good week, right? And Charlie, Charlie, I can see Charlie biting his nails <laughs> and Big Oz like, nah, I'm not having that. And he says, we're not on the pitch, don't get the bonus. And Charlie's thinking about it and Charlie went, nah, I'll take my chances. So the gaffer names the team. Because I'm thinking, I've scored in the quarterfinal against Ayr, I've scored in the semi-final against Dunfermline. At least they won't, I'll definitely be on the bench, nice. you know what I mean? So they named the team in the subs and I looked to her and Charlie was like, maybe when the gaffer walked to it, he went, <laughs> what? <laughs> and I'm fucking raging, right? I'm going like that. So, <laughs> so I'm trying to get his attention, walking onto the bus, going to Parkhead, the finals at Parkhead. I said, so about that bonus thing? They're like, do one, right? <laughs> so, so I'm sitting up there and they did mate, named uh, Peter Van Vossen, Theo Schnelders, and David Robertson had came from anywhere. <laughs> David had been injured for whatever, I don't even know who he was training. Um, but he came from anywhere and the gaffer put him on the bench, right? And I'm thinking, I was raging. That was, no. Oh. So you can see him? Uh, so after the, after we won it, uh, having a wee do back at the club and we're all talking to the gaffers and we're on the dance floor and he's like, McKinnis came here and he's like, Matt, and he's trying to give me a cuddle. And I'm like, what's that all about? And he's like, come see me tomorrow. And I said, what was that all about? I'm trying to have a conversation. He's like, see me tomorrow. So I goes in, 10 o'clock next morning, chaps the door and I, and I walks in and I says, uh, and he pulled out a medal and he stood up shoot, oh, and gave me the medal. He says, you've got a medal, you've earned that, you've played in every round. He says, uh, he says, I'll make sure you get the full bonus. So right away, I'm kind of, right, my, <laughs> my anger's kind of, and he said, uh, Dale, once you come this side of it, he said, uh, I needed a striker on the bench and I needed a goalie. And he says, and David Robertson has earned my loyalty for the last three or four years. And in time, you'll get the benefit yeah. of that. And when you become a manager, you're leaning boys like that. So, so I'm like, everything I was writing up to say, it's like, thanks very much. Full bonus, aye. <laughs> yeah, Mate, so that's genius, that son. Aye. So, there was reasons for it. And, and listen, you know, I, even when I'm picking a bench now, and, and it was a bit easier last week, last season with nine subs, and you've got, you've got an ability to try and keep everybody right and happy, but there were still times you had to leave good boys out. And, you Is know, that the toughest part of it, though? As it can be, but I think it's important to manage you don't dwell on it too much because yeah. your your focus is needed on your starting eleven. That's what you need. You can't be, you know. And I always one of these managers who at times would maybe I'd like to nine times out of ten I like to name my team on a Friday and go through what we need to do because I like I like to be prepared and and I like my team to be prepared. But there is times where I think, Joe, you know I'm going to sleep on it um, if you're wrestling with something. Um, and, I, and I remember. Um, Walter had done that a lot he says sometimes wake up on a Saturday and go with your gut just whatever your first thought is that's your and then Sir Alex very soon when he speak to him he'll say no nah, I can think him worse I always like to have my team on a Friday he says I need a good sleep mm. so he says many times you can settle on your team settle on your subs Friday night get a good kip it's so important that you're fresh and see to be honest since I went to Kamala I've, I've <coughs> done that I've done that I've tried to be settled with everything wake up Saturday morning of your mind yeah. Yeah. you usually wrestle with someone in bed but it's, <laughs> it's certainly not that that's for sure it's a bad one bad one for me to do <laughs> Del C he said did Walters have ever str struggled with Gaza at all no no he was good with him and he obviously he does uh, turned a blind eye to loads um, and he was always a wee bit like that with, with, the, with the goalie as well you know the goalie was um, the best goalkeeper I've ever played with he was outstanding and 
you know, um, Andy would come in the morning grumpy and could see he had a baby in that and he would just sit there, gloves on, no speak to anybody. And then he'd go out and perform, couldn't he beat him? 1v1s, saving everything. And then as soon as his train was over, right, like, where are we going? <laughs> it was a different character again. Um, and the gaffer loved Andy and we all loved Andy and these characters in the dressing room and with Gaza, it was, um, he couldn't sleep, he was hyperactive and he was up to all sorts at night. Uh, he was, uh, he used to come in with the waders zone up to there, but a wee tiny tie for John Gregg. Where my shirt and tie, yeah. Right? Um, and he was just always keeping, must have kept the gaffer on his toes. It was only a couple of times that ever kind of really got a hand and it was towards the end. Um, and, uh, the gaffer, you know, team meetings could rip into him, you know, and, just, um, and leave guys in tears, to be honest. Maybe, yeah. that effect. I, I never seen the gaffer blow too much, but the two or three times I did, um, it was near, it was near pretty. So, and because we had so much respect for him and for, you didn't want to, you would never disrespect him, you know. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I was funny, I was listening to the, my playlist came on, it was the Eagles, Essentials came on, I'm driving down to Kamarnock last week and it just remind, it takes me back to the gaffer coming in at the gym. I'd always been in the gym late on in the afternoon and he'd come in, just took the music off, put the Eagles on and him batting it and go, real fucking music, McKinnis, don't say a word. And he used to sing and he was murder, he used to sing. <laughs> It took up his voice and you're thinking, well, any chance, get us off, you know what I mean? <laughs> what but would he do? Run, run a machine or? Run a machine, bike, everything. Him and Archie at a fair. Good Nick, was he what last Yeah, brilliant. Uh -huh. Aye, aye, he's good Nick. So him and Archie used to either run around the pitch forever. It, it was the slowest jog, but they were running. Or run the gym, batting it every day they were doing something. Or Brilliant. he'd tennis. He'd tennis was legendary. Oh, and did you, the boys need to ref it? Boys used to ref it and you, that was what you didn't want. It was like, uh, Archie would just turn around, you're the ref. And it was like, oh, oh no, no, that's horrible. So, and the thing is, I remember, um, things on, you couldn't, you, <laughs> nobody was, once you were in the dressing room and the game started, <laughs> you, you couldn't even. get out. Nobody could get in. <laughs> like, the loud room that, if they were go and pick his way up for school and stuff like that. That's um, fucking hell, shut up. get in. <laughs> fucking out. Who was out. better at the two of them? Better player? Uh, Gaffer was brilliant in it because he was taller, but uh -huh. Archie was, Good player. He, he could uh, he'd get about, he would never get up. You'd need to kill Archie in a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, he would need, he would be the two of them or uh, just winners. You know what I mean? It, it meant everything. You know what I mean? So. And Why is that going to like that anymore? It's amazing, isn't it? Well, it can be. Did you do that? You're, it it can be. We, the, we do. We set, up, we set up head tennis every morning and it's there. I think head tennis is good for you. Amazing, mate. Touch. It's touch, anticipation. Yeah. Um, and, but I hate people who play head tennis just because oh, you're telling to play head tennis and they just get through the motions. See if I'm in a team with somebody and the boys know trying as hard as me, it's like they're not playing this Saturday. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Can't be doing that. And it's <laughs> and it is good for you. It is good for you. So we do it every day. We take on the young boys and take on players all the time. And you see young boys and that like, getting better. Yeah. It's so, too basic for some modern day managers now, isn't it? I don't like it. Uh, it needs to be yeah. more complicated. So, um, but no, we're um the gaffer was brilliant at dealing with all those personalities, and you can only imagine the the pressure he was under. But I think the you know, I became really close to, to the gaffer when, when I became a manager, to be honest. It was more that. I thought I was always close to him. Then he left and Dick came in and Dick was totally different. You know, it was the end of an era for a lot of our boys. It was, Duke was away, we Stuart McCall, Goffey, uh, Andy, Durante, Costa, and nobody was getting contracts. Myself and Ian Ferguson got another, another year. Um, and it was a different dressing room. It went from being probably the guys who didn't drink being frowned upon to the guys who did drink all of a sudden you were the, the ones Bad that were the, uh, so and I had to change that culture probably did have to change but um, it was good it was interesting <sighs> but it, it was um, he had his strongest team we used to do 11 v 11 every day every day? every day so much, huh? so even on a Monday uh, you wouldn't do it as long obviously on a Monday <clears> that, <throat> you knew the team on a Saturday and it's demoralising that for the week. on the fringes I think so would he stop that 11 v 11 quite a bit Del have you seen some riding like that a lot of the time was, I, yeah. but it was just that um, repetition you know it was a lot of passing don't be wrong with loads of good players and some of the players he signed like Giovanni and that were brilliant players um, we had some good times at, at, at that time uh, I'd done my cheekbone in training Tony Vidmar elbowed me cheekbone collapsed and I always remember I was lying I was agony and Fizzy came running on and seen Advocate come around and he's like and McInnes, your bib, and he just took the bib off. <laughs> took my bib and gave it to me, Barry Nicholson. <laughs> I'm like, I am all right, aye. Um, <laughs> First man, uh, aye. So I went to, um, when I came back for that fractured cheekbone, uh, it was October, November, and I asked to go on loan. Because um, then it was near a window or anything like that. And 
Stockport it was um, the championship at the time Gary Megson and he right. came up to watch a reserve game against Celtic that had played at Ibrox and uh, he phoned my agent the next day and he just said look I'd like to take Derek so we got that set up and I went there for 14, 15 games loved it loved it I met Cookie who's one of my best mates now and a lot of boys are still keep touching good player wasn't he Cookie? Cookie was a good West, player West um, so we were a bit we were mid-table in the championship you know and Stockport were just a small provincial club they're doing well again and they're going the right way again but yeah. um it was it was brilliant and it was one of the ones where I wasn't I was enjoying it that much playing every week again after I had all my injury problems that I wasn't um so bothered about going back and but I, um Dick wanted to me come back to be part of the squad and um he said to me it looks as you you've done well been watching you and just so I was on the fringes it still but then he played me in the cup final against Celtic and we won the treble which um we made it all worthwhile to be honest so um, he had the trust in me in that one and then when I left Gary Megson, he says, look, if I ever get to a proper club that I can afford to get you, you'll be my first signing. And to be fair, West it, when he went to West Brom, <clears throat> and I, I was that. So, um, you know, it was good. Um, Rangers was, was special. Uh, uh, the time with Walter in particular, our dressing room will never be beaten. We're still, we're still pals in the group chat and mm. it can get a bit lively at times, but um, great memories. Is McCoy the man? Ah, uh, he is. He's, he's a bit sensible me these days, no, honestly, no. Nah, but he's a... Uh, he still got his moments. We still golf and that, and he's he's a neighbour and um but he loves all the crack with the boys, you know. I mean Try and get him to do the hydro for us, mate, will you? Hydro? Uh, Aye. Can you get him to do it? I'll say to him, hey. Great to go up there with a heavy drink with you too, wouldn't it? Oh, I'd be that's the that's the dream. Would you, yeah. yeah. you invite us up to the house? To us up? to you and Coyce. Coyce. See the size of Coyce's house? Is it massive? Massive. That's it. Yeah. Be great to go up there. Used to say my driveway's that big, I've got a wimpy in it. <laughs> he was gorgeous as well McCoy's back in the day yeah, yeah. I, I always started. remember the first, day, the first game boy, I watched, we were playing traffic this was my debut and we're driving him on the Friday and he goes like he says hey, we'll just go in together tomorrow because he liked a pint after it right? so and I said aye fine he says so who's driving he's like you're driving I says right well, fine I'll pick you up so pre-match off 11 upstairs in the kitchen so I said I'll get you about 10 to 11 he said aye still sitting there at 10 past and a quarter past and I'm shite myself because I'm going to be late my yeah. first game he came swelling and doing the papers and all that, right? Reading the papers, like, we're plenty of time. So I'm driving like, loony, right? Make sure, imagine being late your first That's day. That's the worst, man. And I've, I've hit a pothole and he's like, oh, I'll get somebody else to drive me in next week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he says I've only got an extra year because you get banned for driving. <laughs> <laughs> but, see, your time at Rangers was a one. Wild... Who would you say was the best player? And I don't like asking that question, but I'm just... Do you know what? It was... Um, Gaza was the best player, yeah. uh, technical player. There was nobody as good as Gaza. That we, we could do these wee, you know, wee two minute possessions you do, men on the side, 4v4, four four whatever. Yeah. You could, there was times you could keep the ball for the two minutes. Just, just holding people up, bouncing it off the side, men keeping it. And you know how, I, I, two minutes a long time, yeah, these yeah. wee possessions, but he was outstanding. Um, Loudrop probably produced those big moments for us more than Gaza. Yeah. You know what I mean? Loudrop was um, a match winner so often um, and the difference in a lot of the games. But you know, Koshti was outstanding. Uh, Charlie, we Charlie Mala, brilliant players, you know what I mean? And a lot of the foreign players that, that, that came in, um, such a good level, you know, and good pros like Jonas Terran and Kinchelis, because all these guys that he played with. But I would say if you're, if you're just talking about a pure, uh, the pure essence of the word football, the best football would be Gaza. Uh, uh, well, obviously, Fergie was a, Barry Ferguson was a young player coming through when you were there. You went on to manage his nephew, Lewis. Uh, was there any comparisons there between the two? No, probably just a, an inner belief and in, in determination. Um, Barry was was always a lot spoke about Barry coming through, and a couple of times, a few times, used to come up and train with, with Gaff and Archie, and um, and they were quite hard on him uh, as well. And it was all part of that development. Um, Barry and uh, Barry Robson were pals, they came through together as well. And, oh, did they, right? Uh, in the YTS. Um, <laughs> and they were the kind of bad boys always had to deal with the gaffers' breakfast and the gaffers' boots and all that. So, And they were seen as the ones that had to be watching, you know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. um, But I think it was all part of the development. Barry was Barry was as good a midfield player in, in the generation. He was outstanding. He would get in any best Rangers 11 for me. You think so, Dad? I thought he was outstanding. Barry and could you tell him. that straight away as soon as he came up? I played with his head up, great hips, switch a play left and right, bit about him, um, could score goals if he was playing a bit forward, great decision maker, short and long passing. He had everything for me, we, we fair game. I thought he was outstanding. Um, and uh, I even remember the, 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 
his debut at Tynecastle because it was after we had won nine in a row. We still had Hearts to play, and uh, the gaffer had just says, "This was the Tuesday night." He says, "We'll see you Friday," and and it was. Gaza turned up, still with strip on, <laughs> one flip flop and one shoe. <laughs> and, uh, so Friday at one o'clock, we're on the in for training. The gaffer the meeting. He says, "Right, I want every day. Yeah, we're all going to the hotel." Uh, we're getting shaved, we're getting a proper wash, we're going to do a week, a uh, few job laps of the pitch. Um, but we need to look like a team tomorrow, make sure we turn up. And, uh, and he went to Gaza, you're going home, make sure you're at the stadium for half one and you're playing 90 minutes. <laughs> and Gaza, just sitting like that, oh God, right. So, so Fer we thought Fergie was going to make his debut, the gaffer hadn't named the team. And we thought Fergie was <laughs> going to make, get his, his debut that day. So I remember on the Friday night, we're sitting. And uh, David Murray had asked that the gaff and Archie around for dinner at his place in Edinburgh. So we'd had dinner and cause he's like dodgy. The David Dodge says, like, the boys are gonna get a couple of beers. He's like, you know enough. He says, just gonna get a couple of beers. And he says, out of the room, play a game of cares. He says, Well, the gaffer's tell me he's checking the rooms at ten o'clock, so I'm just warning you. If that's you want, you want a day. Fair enough. So <coughs> we're in the room playing cards and that's getting a bit lively. Um I always remember McCoy used to pick the phone up. He's like, who am I speaking to? He's like, me boy Michael. He's like, right, Michael, it's Alan McCoy here. He says, you bring 12 Budweiser's up, son, every 20 minutes. And we'll look after you, right? So we're all sitting. Me, Fergie, sitting there amongst it. He's no drinking, but Fergie. Um, so he's sitting, dilling out the curtains and all that. And me doing it, he's going, cheat him. Sixteen year old, you know what I mean? <laughs> Play the girls as bold as brass. And um, next minute the phone goes. And it was, uh, or oh, before that, it was a brilliant card game with Gaza and Charlie. Gaza's just got that much money, right? He was just going blind all the time, yeah. right? So Gaza, uh, Charlie's sitting with a flush, proper, proper hand. He's going, just matching it. So everybody's out and it's going on. Gaza's just putting the money in, going blind. So Charlie's having to go double all the time. He's going, Gaza, just repeat your kids, right? <laughs> so honestly, the best ever, that's right. So um, there's a bit, all sorts in the pot, right? Don't, couldn't even begin to tell you how much money's in the pot, right? So eventually, like, Gaza, well, why do you play kids here? So he's like, turns his card, three, 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 you just grabbed the one, Charlie just kicked it down. <laughs> Honestly, it was the best ever. And then uh, the, ga the phone goes, and it was uh, dodgy. Gaffer and Archie checking the rooms. You're a clown, you're an idiot, you're all hanging. So the gaffer walks in. All the beers are bottles are behind the big curtains. And uh, <laughs> it was a big Caledonia hotel on Princess Street. And he comes in. The guy just looks at her. And he's like, it was we Greg Shields, Shields, Miller, Wilson, Ferguson, Bed. And Charlie's like, I mean, what would we tell? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, I'm all right here. So, he gets, so they all left, right? And I know he gets, what's going to happen, you're brilliant. So he goes over the phone, he's like, Michael, it's Walter Smith here. And he's like, can I have uh, 10 Budweiser's and a bottle of champagne, son? Put the phone down. <laughs> Starting for the He didn't sit and play girls, but another round of drinks, you know what I mean? And, oh, and bro, they went out like, get your bed, you know what I mean? So, it's unreal. I always remember doing the warm up that day, and we, John Robertson, had to score two goals to beat Wally Ball's record at Hearts or something. And of course, he's shouting at him, if you don't beat it today, you'll never beat it. <laughs> <laughs> beat three one. I scored that day, by the way. That's the best part of the story, aye. So Did he get his two goals? He got his two goals. Did he, right? Robo, aye. But then it was the helicopter thing right? back to the, the helicopter thing back to the club, um, the celebrations and that. It was brilliant, so special with that. And it was a special group of boys. We, we all loved each other, do you know what I mean? And we'd do anything for each other. And the gaffer having to try and manage all that, all mm -hmm. those different personalities, it says a lot about him. And he didn't always have it. Easy, there was a lot of pressure on the gaffer, do you know what I mean, to, to deliver that nine in a row. And you've seen that ten in a row just fell short. You've seen it's happened now with, you know, it's Jockstein, Neil Lennon and Walter never quite managed a ten, yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, but he was, uh, he was a brilliant manager. Really miss him, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. still can't believe it. he's away, to be honest. Um, and he was such a confidant for me, somebody I could lean on. I, I'm probably guilty of not leaning on too many people. I think you always try to find your own way and I've never been wanting to look for too much advice, but he was always the first port of call for me all the time. So I became really close to him as a manager. Um, went to a few LMA dinners together and stuff like that and we always got... I thought Is he good company, really Dale? Was he good company, Dale? Uh -huh. As good a company as you'll get, aye. But well, can you just talk to him about it, Aye, drink the red wine and away. And there were so many other players who were close to him because they had built those relationships over years. But I felt latterly I got a, 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 an indication of what that was like as a manager because I felt me and him were um, were close, and I think he liked to help me, and he liked to he liked when I phoned him, you know. So mm. 
It's a shame that uh, he's gone too early. It's just a massive loss for everybody. So you said obviously about Advocat naming, naming his team on a Monday. So you knew on a Monday if you weren't playing on a Saturday. Was it yeah. was there resi games in between that and any of the big players that knew they were, they were going every to Every game, play? every week, every other week, you'd maybe try to get involved in the, the reserve game. But because you're playing eleven v eleven, you got good fitness for that anyway. So and he always used to say, "Be you're paid well to be ready." So that was his thing. But I remember one time it was a time when Big Alberts and Kinchelsea said, "Can I?" and squeezed out the team a wee bit and we were playing Aberdeen at Pataudry on the Tuesday night and the reserves and the reserves <clears throat> so Bert Van Lyon comes in after training on the Monday and he puts his squad list up and right away he Charlie's out he's like you're in it not Dale and he's laughing right? we're going to Pataudry on Tuesday night and then he turned and went can you ask us you're in it right and everybody's first out laughing and Andre's like what he's like yeah, you're in it you're going to Aberdeen he's like I'll not be going to Aberdeen and Van Ly- uh, Bert Van Lyon heard him he went oh you'll be there and he went I fucking won't <laughs> <laughs> so obviously Bert's went up to tell the gaffer. So we dick comes down, storming down, he went, hey, You think you're special, Kinchelski? You fuck it, you think you're special, you know go to Aberdeen? He went, Listen, no reserves at Fiorentina, no <laughs> reserves at Everton, no reserves at Man United, no fucking reserves at Rangers, right? And we're all sitting like that and he went, You'll be there, you'll be there, Kinchelskis. He's like, I fucking won't. He went, be two weeks wages, two weeks wages, you'll be there. And Andre just went and he's he's caught, he's he's blazer. Pulls his check out, right suit, and he just threw it. Me dick was raging. <laughs> me and Charlie's like, two weeks later, Charlie's like, what's he on? <laughs> <laughs> he's like, me. So we're sitting, going up to the door on the Tuesday, and Charlie's like, I'd love to be able to do that. <laughs> but, and was that the end of Kinchelskis after that? I don't know if it was the end. It was just, it was, it was just a clash. Like, a player like that's not going to be happy, no playing, do you know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, but Andre was a brilliant boy. He was uh, dead, he just immersed himself in the club and he was in, interacting with other young boys and um, he was he was different class. I always remember the time as well when his first day. Charlie was we used to sit together, and because it was short and tie and, and Andre came in, he was in the shower still, and Charlie's had his old socks on for the day before, and the, the socks yes, so Charlie just went into Andre's shoes and put his socks on right. <laughs> so we're up for having lunch, and I think one of the things we have a cat. So half one we used to go up for lunch, and we couldn't eat until he used to sit down and go right. You enjoy your lunch. So I like waiting for half. No one. way. It was. So sitting there, right? Wait, do that. So Andres came storming in. He went, "Who's doing my fucking socks?" Right? And Charlie's like, and he's like, Charlie's buttoning his wee hanger, right? He's like, "Who's doing my fucking?" Charlie kicked me on the table. He's like, "Don't say nothing." The mad Russian here. <laughs> so he was raging, proper raging. So the next day, Andres came in, a big, you know, the big green bag, not suspenders bag. <laughs> 50 pairs, it was a 7.99 silk socks, 50 pairs of them, just flung them on the dressing table. Socks for every fucker. <laughs> we got socks. We are here. We are still the socks. I, I love how Charlie Miller's always trying to do you in, man. No, nah, me and Charlie used to, we were back each other up. Like, me, <laughs> me and Charlie, like, it was me and him against McCoy and Durant all the time. Um, but right for the start, Durant, he was, I grew up a fan, Durant, he was up there for me and I loved him and I'd obviously got to know him through different people a wee bit, but no, the way so at Rangers, my first day after I'd signed, the next day I was in training and uh, you had to wear a shirt and tie and I had came from Morton, I didn't really wear a shirt and tie, only the club suit and so I remember going out with my missus and thinking, I need to get some shirts, some ties, so I'd got a few hangs and I got this kind of, kind of tweedy jacket and I think about it, this kind of denim shirt and a nice wee kind of golden thing, denim tie hang, right? So I actually looking all right. So I've walked in and Durante was always there, he sat, his peg was under the queen, he was in every morning, right? First in, sitting with his legs crossed. And I'm walking in with Jimmy Bell um, uh, with my shirt and tie and that on. He went, for fuck's sake, I've signed Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I'm like, all oh, right. And he kept going, what are you wearing? And he's there looking at me. Right? So there's me. And every time the boy, one of the boys came in, Trevor Stephen, I'm like, oh, he's like, hey, Trevor, met me Prince Charles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honestly, I had that idea. And, uh, and it was brilliant. And I always remember that my first day. I had, a, I had a club motor for Morton still, it was a big Peugeot, Burgundy Peugeot, right? It was like every taxi in Glasgow was a Peugeot <laughs> at the time, right? So I'd parked it, I'd been running the reservation, parked it heading back towards Paisley, um, the other side. And uh, I remember coming out of the, the Ibrox and Charlie came out at the same time. And I'm kind of getting my motor and he's like, <laughs> taxi, shout, right? So in the morning I came in and the boys are up with, uh, you got a taxi car, you got a car there for your taxi. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, but Durante was, I remember he came up to me and he's like, I'm all having a bit of panic. He says, you're a good player, you'll do well here. He says, anyone, <laughs> come and see me. I'll look oh, at bro, it. Yeah. So there was always that joke 
a jag, but it was a and joke. Yeah, and a cuddle, and, 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 and Durante's, no, he's the best boy, you know. Amazing. Right, on to Dundee United. No, just I'm a wee bit of him. Andy McLaren. Andy McLaren is one of the best guys that's ever lived. Yeah. He's a legend, isn't he? I love Andy and he's had tough, such a tough life and yeah. a lot of things to deal with and contend with but we used to travel together um, and uh, I, you know it's just so it's so fond of him still now I met him last week at Boydie's Test uh, Golf Day thing and we still play golf Andy and myself and Charlie occasionally we don't do it as much as we probably would like to but um, he's done brilliant for himself and he was brilliant then I remember I used to pick him up used to meet him at the little chef at Westerwood <laughs> and he'd uh, He'd be like, ah, take my motor today. And I'm like, right, but you get into his motor. He didn't have a sunroof. It was a, it was a, it was like an ashtray. It was like, you know what I mean? It was like a skip his motor. It's like a chimney, the, the, the thing we, and it was just smelling of fags. And then he'd be sitting with his coffee, a Twix, trying to drive, <laughs> his fag and his phone. And I'm thinking, really? I'm like, just take my motor tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? Was he wild? And in additional? Lively. I remember when we first signed, we were kind of struggling and uh, Andy was without a club. I think Coyle had set it up, Ian McCall, Andy McLaren was going to come in. And we were sitting like third bottom of the table in my first season. Um, and Andy, I swear, I thought, well, I just kicked the dressing room over. went, panic's over, we'll be tap six by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and we were, and we were. He was, was he brilliant there, was he? <laughs> he was different class. <laughs> panic's <laughs> over, I was not going that. Um, <laughs> but technically, Andy, you know what I mean? He, right foot, left foot, what a player he was. He, he, um, quality um, and I, I loved him I still love him now we're good, good pals and he was great for us in that dressing room we, and I think back now for Ian McCall it must have been tough the opinions in that dressing room it's <laughs> like you get your age and, yeah. or your age when <laughs> you're the new you think you know her and you think every manager's doing what's he doing yeah. you know what I mean we should be doing that we should be doing that it was me Jim McIntyre Alan Archibald Barry Robson Charlie Muller we were all too much to say uh, I thought Looking back, but what a brilliant dressing room. Do you know what I mean? We we go to the cup final that year, Alan Thompson beat uh, 1 0. We go into Europe and we finished, I think, fifth in the league. So it wasn't all bad, but we, uh, we, we we promised to deliver more than we did. It was disappointing that we'd never done more. Um, we had a lot of good players in, but maybe not quite the right balance. Mm. Did you yeah. stay up there? With, did you stay up in Dundee? No, I travelled every day and I stayed up on a Friday. Was that, was that, did you stay with Charlie? No. no. What's no. the one with the physio? <laughs> oh, Barry Robson telling the story, big Clarky, Jeff Clark. So, uh, no, I used to stay up on a Friday night in the hotel with Andy and Grant Brebner and that. We used to just stay and have, try to do things right and get that rest and that. And then, <coughs> no, but uh, Barry Robson tells the story because Barry used to go into Barry's a lot, uh, Charlie's a lot and brought a ferry on a Sunday and Charlie would be super Sunday sitting there all day, a few cans and that. And uh, there was one time he was supposed to get in for treatment, his ankle was blown up for the game on the Saturday and I think we were playing the Wednesday night, maybe Aberdeen, maybe, I can't remember. And, uh, Barry says he goes run. He says he's one of the best ever. He says he's in. And there's Clarkie, the physio, doing massaging, game treatment with Charlie. And Charlie's lying with a can and a fag watching the football. Say, any chance, Clarkie? That's there. <laughs> um, so that was uh, it's fancy was get a day's dinner fucking bro but uh, because Clarkie was a neighbour instead of Charlie going there he came to Charlie so but then me and Barry went out to Bergen to see Charlie playing in Norway um, and he was a god over there I couldn't <laughs> believe it out for a night out with him and everybody singing his name everywhere you went you know what I mean and me and, me and Barry went out there two or three nights with Charlie out there it was, it was brilliant so was Charlie brilliant as well there? Yeah, he's a great player Great player, that change of pace to get away from people and left foot, right foot, that last pass, the calmness, never rushed in the final third. Great finisher. Um, he was just didn't like the run inside it mm. um, and probably uh, probably didn't fulfil his full potential, but uh, he was good value for every team he played in. Just a pity he never, because I think that generation, you know, that the, the, talent, he, the talent he had, if he just maybe channeled it a wee bit more, but... Um, I don't think he's got any regrets, but he was the best boy. Charlie would give you his last penny, do you mm. know what I mean? And he was, uh, me and him were tight. We used to room together all the time. Um, and uh, still good pals, you know. Uh, and he had... Uh, he's going to be a grandpa as well. Which is, is he? Oh, brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, is he? brilliant uh, and Dale had an open goal favourite. Charlie McGrew was a young boy as well, didn't you? That's shit. He was wet behind the ears then, wasn't he? Do you know what? He was... He, uh, I love Charlie now when you see him he's, he's and what a sign he's been for Dundee United I mean mm. he's, he could hardly have been up there for the running player of the year as well he's that influence on that team but no he was young and he was talented when he came to us and uh, but he used to travel up with us so this was after Andy had left um, Chizzy was the manager I think Chizzy knew 
I got uh, Big Charlie up with Gordon Chisholm and it was me, Mark Kerr, uh, Charlie and... Was Alan Archibald you said? I think maybe Crack, Alan Archibald or Big David McCrack maybe. <coughs> we were up and uh, it was Craig Brewster's um, at the time so we were training at midnight, uh, no, <laughs> five o'clock, uh, second session. And um, so Charlie was like away and as soon as he got in the motor he was away. Um, so we're driving down, we go back to the little chef at half five. And you could see him as we were going around, he's like, oh no, I think I've left my keys in the locker. No, my keys. And then he's like, he's turned around, his motor's still sitting, it was the winter, and it was like freezing, his motor's defrosted, just sitting with the engine running for half seven. <laughs> he'd left the keys. Come along, that was a strange thing. I can't believe it was still there. <laughs> Come along. Uh, but no, uh, Brilliant, but he man. was, he was, he was, he was a good player. He was always going to have a good career, Charlie. Yeah. Uh, just last week, bit, man, this has been sensational. Uh, St. Best. Johnston. So the, the bit where you come into being a manager. So, Aye, so played, played at St Johnson at the time? Yeah, so I'd been at Millwall, um, signed a two year deal, it was my, more relationship with Ray Wilkins at the time, and he's like, I'm doing. Um, Is he a hero at him, or was he? Aye, so it was him and Nigel Spikeman and Willie Donicky, and you know, I had an offer for St Johnson before I got it, um, and I'd left in D United, and an offer for, um, potentially an offer for St Martin with Gus, and then Coyle was like, look, two year deal, come and help get us up, you'll be captain, blah, blah, blah. I said, right, okay, it's fine. So. Um, that was all sorted and Coyley phoned me on Monday night and he said listen St John's the only way to do the only day one year deals for players over 30 and I went oh, I've played 100 games over 100 games I've done United in three years it's a two year deal Coyley and he's like ah, listen you'll play every week just come you'll get your two years I said no it's two years and we're not doing it he's like Dale I promise you you'll play every week so I had a two year deal on offer for Millwall and, that, and, uh, and I thought do you know what it was four or five times the money I was going to offer to St Johnston but it didn't really suit but I ended up going to Millwall, probably for the wrong reasons when I look back now. And uh, um, so then Ray Wilkins said, look, play the game Saturday, go back up Saturday night, train locally with your team, just come down the Wednesday night. It was a perfect contract, yeah. 35. And I was getting well paid for it. But it didn't sit well, mate. It didn't work. That's all fine, that stuff, if you're winning every week. Um, but when you're the captain and there's a post-mortem for losing a game on a Monday and I'm Underhead. cutting about in Scotland. Mm. So it felt as if I was... Uh, my wee boy Harry had just been born. I felt as always been half a husband, half a player, half a captain, half a dad. I just fell short. And I then ended, ended up signed for St. Johnson in the January, I signed for the six months. Um, we nearly got up. We, we Gretna got up that year. We ended up 15 points in January behind, but took it the last game and we were actually promoted at one point until Gretna scored in injury time. And then Coyler left to go to Burnley in October, I think it was. And Sandy Stewart was assistant. Sandy was taking the, cha the Challenge Cup final <coughs> and he'd asked me to give my wee home with the training. So we're driving back for Dens. We beat them Fairman and to win the Cup. And he says, eh, Dale, I'm just got to tell the chairman I'm going with Coyley. I'm joining Burnley tomorrow. And I said, all right, okay. So the phone goes Monday morning. Stuart Duff, chief executive, says, hi, um, do you know Sandy's away? And I said, yep. He says, could you take the team, prepare the team for Saturday? I said, yep, fine. He says, we need to get a manager. I said, yep. And he says, why don't you apply for it? And I says, I hadn't thought about it and I genuinely hadn't. What, well, you hadn't thought about management? I, had, I thought about management, I knew I wanted to be a manager but I hadn't thought about applying for that job because I just thought that I was just playing, I was taking the reserve team at the time right. and see when I think about it, I don't know why I didn't think about applying for it, I was just, and he said, uh, Jeff wants to speak to you, um, can you come up tonight at half six? And I said, that's fine. So I drove up, I thought it was just for a chat, six o'clock news, 10 news, to get the Broxton round about uh, St. Johnston have called a press conference to announce a new manager tomorrow and I'm going, I thought my missus, I was like, by the way, I think they've got a manager. She says, they said they're bringing one out. So it was in Jeff Brown's like, do you want to be the manager? And I said, aye, he went, he says, I think you'll be a great manager. He says, I'm offering you the job. And I was like, that was it. He says, I've watched you in interact with the players and I didn't know Jeff Brown. I'm one of the old school like, players shouldn't really know all the directors, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. um, and he says, I like the way you are, you contacts in the game and see the way you are with people. He says, I think you'll be great. And I says, so does my money go out? Does it go a manager's contract? Is it my players? And he says, you'll be a player manager, we'll give you an increase. He says, just go and um, we'll announce it tomorrow. I said, right, fine, shoot hands. Real leap of faith for him because I didn't have that much experience, but it felt, felt good, felt right. And once I was in, I was in, do you know what I mean? So I loved it. What good? What was your best time at St Johnston? Best memories. Winning the league that first year. So <clears throat> um, when we took over, we were bottom half. But that first, the next season, when I managed to make a lot of changes, we we, we won the league. And that was 
that was pretty special to be honest. Uh, um, the boys were still with guys Irvin and yeah, uh, Jizo, uh -huh. uh, Martin Hardy, Kevin Rukovic, you know, Jody, Dubs, Alan May and Stephen Mott, all the boys, Liam Craig, Paul Sheeran, you know what I mean? We're still we're still in touch, you know what I mean? It was yeah. uh, great times at St Johnston. And we went into Premier League, I think we finished eighth in the first season, then when I left to go to Bristol City the following year, I think we were sitting third or fourth in the league. So it's a good story, St Johnston, and hopefully they get out of it. Yeah. This season, because for the last 15 years, a lot of managers have done well and it's been a good story for them. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure Callum will, will get it sorted. Do you see when they're just, we're neat to it's not like that here all day. See when, in Bristol City, how do you look back at your time with them? Do you know what? Um, so I'd felt, I'd re rejected a couple of jobs in England and I felt when it came, there was a few people saying to me, be careful with Bristol City, they've had four managers in three years. Mm. They were bottom of the league, 10 points adrift, the second bottom when I took over. So, but it was still end of October and I still thought it was enough games. Uh, and we took it on and we stayed up. And it was probably as good an achievement that, that I've ever had, you know, because... Um, it's a tough league at the championship. It is. And we, we, we did so well that second half of the season. I signed Chris Wood and Lowe and he was brilliant for me. Um, just through contacts at West Brom and he was outstanding for me. And what we should have done in that summer was... I should have been kicking and screaming to get rid of more players. Every list I gave the board about players that needed to be moved on, they never really took me on. They never, it was so hard to deal with because Bristol City was the best club these boys were going to be at. They mm. were all well paid and they weren't wanting to go anywhere. So we had four different managers signings in a dressing room, which was complicated. But when the board came to me, says, look, we're trying to reduce, we had to reduce financial fair play, we needed to reduce the playing budget in half. So I had to go for like 15 million, just over 7 million. Um, and we want to try and if you need to get rid of the senior players and bring young ones in. So we Joe Bryan, who's just won promotion again with Fulham, made his debut at 16 for me and put Joe on the team. Bobby Reid, who's just won promotion. Yannick Balassi, who was playing in the reserves, nowhere near it, we brought him in. Did it. you bring Balassi in? Uh -huh. Yannick in, uh -huh. who was brilliant for us. Um, he they ended up selling him to Palace oh, when I thought insane. we should have worked harder to keep him. Um, with Albert Doma, who was outstanding. I loved my time at Bristol City, and do you know what? I really loved the club. I, I was destined to be the guy that got it going. Yeah. But I probably put too much faith in, in the club to, to do what they needed me to do. They said, look, this club's flirted with relegation for too many years. If we go down with Derek McInnes, we come back with Derek McInnes. You help us sort out the financial mess, we'll come back up. We lost a home game just after New Year to Leicester. Leicester ended up going out, they were a brilliant team. I think we lost, it was either 4-1 or 4-9, and got the the shout after it going to uh, part ways with this thing I think we needed a change and it was a shock mm. it shouldn't have been a shock because we're still in the bottom two yeah. um, but after all the conversations I'd had but you live and learn and then a few weeks later I get the Aberdeen job so it's uh, everything for a reason you know so it was uh, I look back mm. with a bit of frustration um, I probably trusted people a bit too much but I still look back and think I could have done things better in terms of um, when I was at my strongest point in Bristol City, I should have been far more uh, demanding. I and, know, I, and that's probably what, when I went into Aberdeen with 13, 14 players out, a contract, and I'd, I let go 13. The only boy I gave a contract was big Josh McGuinness, um, gave him a contract. Uh, and I think because I'd been um, maybe kind of fingers burnt at Bristol City, I just thought I need to get rid, make sure I put my own stamp in this club and that's what I did. So if I hadn't had the experience of Bristol, I might not have been as forthright at Aberdeen. Mm. Amazing. Is England something you want to have a crack at again? So I think also. I would like to. I don't think it's, it's not something that's, I want, there's certain things I want to do. I want to manage Scotland and there's certain clubs I would love to manage. Um, but you don't always get what you want, but I'm, I'm, I still feel, I feel as a better manager now than mm. I am. I've still got the, the enthusiasm. I've still got the, I feel, still got loads to offer, but I've also had, Loads, I've learned loads as well, you know, so I think uh, management's still the same no matter what age you are, as long as you have that connection with your, your team and, and you make good signings and recruitment and you get good support and you've got, because you, we all work for clubs, but you work for people within the clubs and if the people are right, um, it makes the, hell, the job hell of a lot easier and um, still loads to do and I'm still young enough to do it. Dale McInnes, outstanding. Thank you, boys. What a guy, cheers mate.